Good morning. Welcome. Y'all ready to worship the Lord this morning? I got one yes. <laughs> Y'all go ahead and stand up. Let's praise the Lord. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory, maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your word, king over all of the universe, to you be the glory. covers me and raises dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity. Giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your word. King over all of the universe, to you be the glory. I'm alive because I'm alive in you. Jesus, I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. Every sunrise sings your praise. The universe cries out your praise. Singing freedom all my days, now that I'm alive. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises dead man's life. All because of Jesus, all because of Jesus, I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus, I'm alive. Yes, yeah. 
Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Good morning. Welcome to Believer's Fellowship. It's always a guessing game when I come up. Am I, am I, is this thing working or not? Uh, but it's great to have you in the house of the Lord this morning. Uh, Miss Terry, know we've been praying for Mr. Gary. Uh, we're praying for a speedy recovery. Amen. It's great to have again have you in the house of the Lord this morning. I want to welcome our first-time visitors and those of, us, those, those of you uh, joining us online. Um, can't wait for you to come and, and be a part of our service or come back and be a part of our service. Uh, if this is your first time here at Believers Fellowship or you have a prayer request, there's a welcome card in the seat back in front of you. We ask that you fill that out. At the end of service, you can drop it in the offering receptacle, and we will be sure to pray over any prayer requests you have. But at the end of service, if you would take that card, uh, meet me out in the foyer. I'd love to meet you, greet you, put a free gift in your hand. At this time, if you will stand and we read uh, God's word, so if you'll stand in the honoring of his word, I'm going to have Miss Christina come, and she's going to be reading today's scripture reading. Today's reading is John 13, 31 through 38. Therefore, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now is, this, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I am with you a, while, a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where am I going? You cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I go, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you right now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, a rooster will not crow until you deny me three times. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to you this morning, Father, it is with humble hearts, Father. Father, we want to put feet to our faith, Father. We just don't want to say, Father, that I will follow you, Father. We want to show that we will follow you, follow you, Father. We want to be the disciples that you've called us to be, Father. 
And, Father, that is through love, Father, first of your love for us, Father, and then us showing that love to other people, Father. And that's love to everyone, Father. That's love to people we don't agree with, Father. Father, love to people we might not like, Father, but you have called us to love, Father. And Father, I pray this morning that you give us that conviction, Father. Give us that courage, Father, to love in a way that only you can love, Father. Father, we thank you for the opportunity just to share your love with people, Father. Father, we just thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. my
the sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who stray. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary and rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So let no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. Amen. You may be seated. What a glorious day. Amen. What a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord. Glad that you're here to worship with us today. We're continuing our sermon series, part two today, of the journey to the cross, which this series will end uh, when we all get to heaven. No. <laughs> it will end on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Day, so be sure to be praying for that day as we gather close to it. Like I said last week, I probably should have named it Journey to the Resurrection but you didn't get to the resurrection without the cross, amen? So we, remember we ended last week in, uh, in talking about Jesus being in the upper room. This whole series has to do with these last days and hours of Jesus with his disciples and the suffering that would follow that and then to the resurrection. But if you remember last week, we, we ended with what was going on in the upper room. They started with the, them arguing about who's the greatest and then the washing of feet by the greatest. And then uh, the... The, the Passover meal together, and then Jesus uh, pointing out there was a betrayer in the crowd. Everybody's asking, is it I? 
he hands the morsel to Judas, showing that that's who it was, and tells him, what are you going to go do, go do now, do quickly? The hour is fast approaching, is in the mindset there. So Judas leaves the room. And then we went right into what Jesus did at that moment, the Lord's Supper. And we took the Lord's Supper during that part of the service. If you weren't here, it was a really unique Sunday, a unique time of fellowship in the Word of God and around the Word of God. Uh, if you don't get the e-blast, then you didn't hear this next part. So if you got the e-blast, you got all of it. So I won't, I'll just briefly share what I'm going to share. If, you don't, if you're not getting the e-blast, it's a Tuesday video message from your pastor uh, about what's going on as, long as, as well as the devotional word. And we talked about how at the end of the Passover meal, uh, what they would always do is that they would stand and, and sing the halal. They would sing uh, a group of hymns, uh, psalms, from Psalms 115 all the way to 118. And I go into a little bit more in our devotional, so you can look at that. It's on our online page as well. You can find it there for a midweek update. But just the, just the think about in that moment, and we've tried to talk about using a little bit of your sanctified imagination during this series to put yourself in that situation and to take yourself back to that time when Jesus is with his disciples, that Jesus led them in worship and singing these, these psalms, the halal. And as he's singing them, these psalms, if you go back and read them, are talk about suffering, talk about uh, heartache, brokenness, you know, a rejection. They also talk about victory and deliverance. They talk about uh, the atonement, the, the, the blood that, that's sprinkled by the high priest. And all this is really just about Jesus. They were all prophetic psalms about Christ. And here he is singing them himself. Wouldn't you like to have been in the room at, at that moment in time? Uh, we're going to be in that moment of time when you take that cup of halal, that fourth cup of communion that hasn't been drunk from yet when we take that with the Lord one day, and we'll join in singing with him. If you don't like singing now, you're not going to like heaven. <laughs> There's a lot of worship, a lot of praise, a lot of rejoicing, a lot of singing, even by Jesus. So if you're one of these silent worshipers, quit being backslidden. The Bible says, let us make a joyful noise. In other words, let, let us be heard in our praise and our, in our worship and in our rejoicing of the Lord. But he's still in the upper room with him during this, this particular point that I'm going to kind of go over with you. In fact... Uh, I'm going to go to look to John. We read from the early part of John just a while ago. And we're going to be looking at that same passage, John 13. If you want to open your Bible, you can. But we're going to be going a little bit further down into the chapter. And we're also going to look at John 14, John 15, 16, 17. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So I'm just going to give you a little bird's eye overview of these chapters. But I want you to remember, these are last words. These are intimate words. This is Jesus sharing with his disciples what's coming, what they're going to have to be dealing with, what's about to happen. And, uh, you know, there's this, this song of deliverance that they're singing in the room, but, you know, Jesus has some more words to share with them as, as that dinner closes and his uh, communion time closes and his Judas is gone. He's telling them, we just read a while ago, about being glorified, and he goes on again in John 13. And I want to kind of give you an overview of some verses here. And you don't have to read them all, but just, you know, I would encourage you, if you haven't started reading these passages, join with us over the next few weeks. He talks about how the Son of Man in verses 31 and 32 is going to be glorified and how that God's going to be glorified in the Son of Man. From this point, I want you to really notice, and, we've, and again, you, we talked about it last week, and I don't want to just beat this thing to death, but it is so important for you to realize how Jesus is relating to these men. Remember last week, that, that first of the communion and Passover time, he says, listen, I've desired to have this Passover with you. He goes on to say, and having loved them, he loved them to the end, all right? To the end of his physical journey with them is what he's talking about. <laughs> but in verses 33 through, through 35, he says, I'm leaving. You know, you, you can't go where I'm going, so you must. You've got to love each other. You've got to love each other so much so that people know that you, that you are mine and that I belong to you and you belong to me. Now, that's a, that's a tall order, not only for these guys, but think about that in the context. These words are to us as well. You know, that in times of crisis, in times of stress, in times of uh, even confusion, it's interesting to notice how many times in family and home and even church, instead of using those pressures to drive us to one another to love each other, they drive us apart all too often. And, you know, it's in times Jesus is making this very clear point. You've got to love each other. And this is kind of a continuing theme through all these last words that he shares with him. And he says, you know, I'm leaving. I'm, 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 you know, I'm not going to be with you anymore. And he's telling about the cross. And, and, of course, Peter stands up at this point, verses 37, 38. He's responding. He says, you know, Lord, I'll go with you wherever. 
And then here Jesus gives him a little check. Okay. Let me tell you something, Peter. Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. Before this night is done, you will have betrayed me three times before the morning rooster crows. <laughs> yeah, and how often has that been so true of many of us at different times? I'm, hey, Jesus, he, he's my man. You know, I'm, I'm with Christ. I'm with the Lord. I'm, I'm serving. No matter what, I'm going on with God. Only to find before 24 hours has drifted by, we failed the Lord in some regard, in some response. But you've got to love what Jesus tells Peter. And again, getting back to that, just how much he loved him. He said, Satan's desire to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. You know, and you're going to return. You know, and when you return, you know. So it, there's this beautiful moment. It, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's putting in place, but doing it in such a, a powerful way. You're going to fail me, but I prayed for you, you know, and you're going to return. And when you do, encourage the brothers, you know, minister to the, to the flock of God. And sure enough, we know that that happened. He said, I, Satan's desire to sift you as wheat. And that's an interesting process to sift as wheat. It had to do with taking a large sheet-like blanket spread out on four corners by, by people and putting the, the wheat in and, and tossing it up so as to break the shaft off it up and down and up and down. And then the good wheat would fall back into the, to the fold and to the sheet and only what was, was trash and you know, husk and stuff would blow away. So basically, Lord said to you, you're going to go through a purifying process. You know, you're going to fail it, but you're, this, it's going to purge some things out of you. <laughs> it's going to take some things out of you that need to go. And when you return, and boy, what a promising word that is, because all of us have walked in those, those shoes of, or sandals, whatever, of, of Peter in that kind of context. And then in John 14, he's, he's still speaking to them. And this is a passage many times we share at funerals. We talk about, I go to my father's house, I prepare a place for you, so that where I am you may be also. And, but this is in the context, this is, He's talking about his departure. I mean, he's going to die at this point. This is a personal word from him about where, what, where they are, what they're facing, what is going on in this moment. So there, I believe there's this strong kind of feeling in the room that's kind of, that's kind of hanging over them as Jesus is talking about those things. And he's saying, you know, I'm, you know you're, going to all, you're going to all run. <laughs> he said, now you got to just, it's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Said, Let me give you the Jerome's translation of five verses. Don't freak out. All right, just believe, trust. I'm telling these things, but I'm telling you the truth, you know. I wouldn't tell you if it wasn't so. You're going to you're gonna have to hang in there. I'm going to the Father's house, and I'm going to get things ready. And then, of course, they respond, well, Lord, how can we know how to get there? And that's that great passage where Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so he lets them know, even in those verses, if, you, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then, then he goes on in verse 14. So if you have any questions, call home. <laughs> you know, you, I've taught you how to pray. I've given you the model prayer. You know the process. You've seen the witness of me praying. You've asked how to pray. I've given you the instructions. So, hey, when it all falls apart and you don't know what's going on, you call the Father and you tell him I said to ask. Because that's basically what it means, ask in my name. It means that we have the access to the Father now. We, we can pray anything according to God's will now. Uh, that means that we're praying in the name of Jesus. So when I, I, when I end my prayers in Jesus' name, it's not just a little mantra that we stick on the end like we're doing, you know, yoga or something, you know, and doing our, our mantra there. It's, this is just identification. It's saying what I'm asking, what I'm praying, I pray it in Jesus' name. In other words, it means I'm presenting all that Jesus is, the very Son of God, the right to the throne room, the, the, the heir of the Lord Jesus Christ. All that his name represents of him and who he is is in that. So it really means that I need to learn how to pray according to God's will. As Jesus is teaching us even later on in this passage in Gethsemane about praying according to the will of God and seeking God's face on what his will is. So he tells him, you know, I'm, <clears throat> if you have questions, call. Verse 16, he goes down, I'm also going to send the helper to be with you. He'll be in you. Verse 21 through 31, he goes down. But you must trust me by doing what I'm telling you to do. Abide, love, follow all these things. Again, this is a kind of a quick version of it all. He kind of wraps it up. The helper's going to remind you of everything that I've said. So he says, you've got to love each other. You've got to trust me. You've got to believe. And I'm sending some, because I'm not going to be here. I mean, after the resurrection, you'll see me for well, that 40 days. You know, But I'm I'm going. But I'm not going to leave you helpless. I send you a helper. 
Now, that's the Holy Spirit, all right, as he comes to guide us and, 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 and remind us and to teach us. And he sent the Holy Spirit, who is the, the, the supreme teacher uh, uh, for us, uh, the one who will convince us, the one who will convict us, the one who will encourage us, the one who will give us insight, the one who will teach us what the Bible's really saying, the one who will make it applicable and apply it to our situa situations and circumstances, he's coming. You know, and he came on the day of Pentecost, all right, so he's going he's gonna to guide you. And then it's as though they, 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 they leave the room at this particular point in time or sometimes right after this, but Jesus, and I, I kind of see this in my mind, you know, it, it, there's one verse that says, let us get up and depart from here. And then it goes into the, to the next chapter. In John 15 and Matthew goes to the next chapter. So they're leaving, and as they're going, it, you can almost see in your mind, I, I don't know, I, I have never walked the course, all right, we're going up from the upper room, leaving that side of, 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 of Jerusalem and coming out the gates there and, and probably the Dung Gate or one of those gates over there, coming out that way and then going across Kidron Valley, how far down they went, and then going up the side of the Mount of Olives to Gethsemane. I'm just going to guess. 35, 40 minutes, because they're walking and talking. They're, I, I can see them you know, in my heart and mind in the dark of night where they've got lamps or torches or whatever it is making their way, and Jesus is, is leading them. And as he's going, he's speaking to them. He's talking to them in the, in the journey as they're going. And this is where he starts talking to them in John 15. There's that great passage, that whole chapter of John 15. You know, as preachers, we have a tendency to dice this stuff all up and kind of lose the flow of what's going on because we'll take a particular passage and what that's saying to us today. But catch the flow of this. I can almost see Jesus walking down the steps, you know, leading them from the upper room as they walk down the steps and make the turn. And there's probably vines growing and trellises that are covered with flowers, such as is today in Jerusalem. You know, bougainvilleas and flowers and vines coming down. And Jesus pointing to one of those says, hey, I'm the true vine. You know, I'm the true vine. My father's the husbandman. If you abide in me, because this just flows with what he's sharing with me, if you'll rest in me, if you'll trust me, if you'll hold on to me, if you won't let go, but you'll rest in me, you know, and, and, and he gives that great passage from John 15 that just is all about abiding and all about yielding and, and all about trusting and, and following the Lord. So he gets into John 15 for us. It's a chapter here. In verses 1 through 11, it's all that. As they're going to get Simeon, it's all that in, in those, those 11 verses is about abiding, being fruitful, being purged when you're not being fruitful, being useful, being successful in your walk, being blessed in your life, having God move through you like, uh, like the life flows through a vine and out to the branches to produce the fruit. You, you're, you're the branch and the fruit's going to come through your life. You're going to experience fruitfulness in your life meaning and substance and usability and servanthood and humility and grace, all this is going to happen in your life. If you abide in me, if you rest in me, if, it kind of wraps it up, if you love me, you will. If you love me, you will. And then he repeats it again in verse, verse 12. You think, Lord, we'd get this lesson by now. But in verse 12, it's, you know, all right, you must love each other. You're, you're going to have to love each other. He repeats it there, you know, in verse 17 again. You must love each other. The world's not going to understand you. He makes it clear to them his whole process in 14, 15. The world's going to hate you. If they hate the master, they're going to hate the servant. But we're so busy trying to get the world to love us. No, the world's not going to understand you. This was the greatest thing I came to, I guess, in the early revelations of my Christian life when I finally gave my life to Jesus, all right? All my friends, when I went to tell about what happened, didn't understand. I, mean, I, I got to thinking about the logic of that anyway because I didn't know the Lord and people were con praying for me and I was under conviction, but I remember getting a Bible out at one time during that process about a year before I gave my life to the Lord and reading things that couldn't make sense. I had their tales of it, you know. Ran into one of them begot sections. You know what those are, right? And so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so and he was the father of so-and-so and he begat so-and-so. And I say, well, okay, I've been begat. But, you know, I, I, I didn't comprehend it. And when I would see Christians that were really on fire for the Lord, weren't that many, but there were some, <laughs> didn't get it, you know. I had this one kid in high school, our senior year, he was a, kind of a redneck cowboy guy. He loved Jesus, you know. People make fun of him, laughed at him. I didn't get him at all. But when I came myself to give my life to Jesus, I understood the tensions. You know, and this is what Jesus is preparing them for. 
I mean, like you've seen Jesus gather tens of thousands probably. At one point, there's probably thousands upon thousands of people gathered to hear him. He says, not going to be that way, guys. You know, if you're going to follow me, you need to realize there's going to be resistance. But isn't it tragic that so many people don't want to feel the resistance? They want to just kind of go along with the world and the world to love them and to celebrate them. And you see it everywhere you turn, so many Christians trying to fit into the mold of the world. They like to demonstrate it and show it off on Facebook, <laughs> social media platforms. And sometimes I see somebody post, like, I thought you were a believer. <laughs> and you just wonder. In fact, Jesus goes on in John 16 and kind of, you know, continues to tell them, hey, you know, the world's going to hate you. And John 16 says, in fact, I tell you, not only are they going to hate you, he said, they may kill you. And pretty much all of them died as martyrs, perhaps, but one died of old age. They may kill you in verse 1 through 4. He talks to them about the fact that, and, and, and verses 5 through 15, he said, but I'm going to go, and as I go, the helper's going to come. There's just too many things that I've got to communicate to you right now that, you, that we just do not have enough time. But the helper, the spirit of truth, is going to make all this clear to you. And how often do we just ignore the spirit of truth in our life as he tries to seek and speak and draw us to the Father and give us insight? He says, you can know it's the helper because he's going to lift me up. And he knows what you need. And as much as you may think you know what you need, he will let you know what you really need and what you need to know. <laughs> and that's the beauty of this moment. Verse 16, he says, I'm leaving you. You're going to grieve. But sooner than later, it will be turned to joy. Let's think about that for a moment. Goodness gracious. Now, catch, again, the, the, the context. You're walking in the night. Whether the stars, moons, whatever's out, gentle breeze. Sometimes it's going to be a big breeze in Jerusalem coming off the mountains there. But they're making their way. You can almost see the flames being blown by the wind. And Jesus saying, just to speaking these words to them where they can all hear. And, and he said, I, I, I am leaving. You need to understand that. And you're going to, you're going to have great grief and sorrow. This is, not, this is not going to be easy to endure or watch. I want you to know we all go through times of great sorrow. But Jesus is making it so clear that we have the helper. We go, we go through times of grief. We go through times of heartache and pain. But Jesus is just kind of reminding us that no matter what you go through or what you're going to experience, I'm going to be there with you. The helper is going to be there with you. He's going to guide you, instruct you. And so that is why it's so, in, in difficult times, it's so important to, to cling to the Word and to cling to the Lord and to allow the Holy Spirit to guide our hearts and minds and to give us the light that we need because it is so easy in times of despair to just cast off things, the Lord, and just kind of go to the corner and kind of live in our misery for the moment. So I'm leaving you, and it's going to be difficult, but we're going to turn your sorrow into joy. And then he, he reminds him again, hey, don't forget to call home. <laughs> Remember to ask the Father in my name, and he will make your joy full. You go down to verse 33. He says, now I'm, I'm saying all this to you so you can have peace. Because this is not going to be peaceful what you're getting ready to go through. This is not going to be joy-filled what you're getting ready to experience in these moments. But if you really want to experience peace, then you're going to have to talk to the Father and you're going to have to go through this meeting. So again, let's, let's get the picture. They've come down the, the, the mount, uh, 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 probably most likely coming off Mount Zion, going down into the Valley of Kidron, which isn't that wide, but it's, it's, it's a good distance. And they're making their way up to Gethsemane. And as they go up to Gethsemane, he's, he's, he's speaking to them. Let me read you what takes place once they, they get to this point and they're, they're entering into the garden in, in Matthew 26. All right. Uh, get past that one slide, as they get to, the, to Gethsemane. In Matthew 26, there's these, these verses. I'll put them on the screen so you can see them as I read them. It says, Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, which would be James and John. And he began, let's catch this, the, 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 the heart of Jesus here. Let's look at, to him and see what he's, what he's experienced. He says, he says, He began to be grieved and to be distressed. And he said to the disciples, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. 
remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying. You may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Then he went away a second time, and he prayed, saying, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came to them, found them sleeping, and their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. What? He's saying the same thing. If this cup, if, it's, if, if this is your will, I will drink it. But if it's not your will, then let it pass from me. Remember? We're in the garden. It's night, whether by lamp or torch. It's dimly lit. He brought the disciples into to Gethsemane with him. He takes James and John and Peter, goes a little farther into the garden and says, you need to watch, you need to pray. Now, these are, we know, his most confidential friends who he's taken to some of the most deep and, and meaningful places in this whole journey. And it's important for the future of the body of Christ, for his bride, the church, is getting ready to give birth, on, to be born on, on Pentecost to have eyewitnesses to these solemn scenes. Now, they keep going to sleep, so there's no telling all the other things that happened <laughs> in this time as they've gone into the garden. And praise God for the humility, they were at least willing to admit, I fell asleep in church. <laughs> Amen. So here's, here's he's, he's beckoning Peter and John and James to come in with him. And they come in and, and they take a seat. And Jesus says, you just wait here. And he goes a bit further. Now, there's another garden called Eden in which the first Adam was in. And the father came beckoning in that garden to the first Adam. And he was hiding because of his shame, because of his sin. And the father says, where art thou? But now we're in another garden, Gethsemane. And when the father beckons, where art thou? The I am answers. In fact, he doesn't just answer. He approaches the Father. He's not running. He's running. If he is, he's running to the Father. Here I am. Let's just take a moment to look at him here. By himself, just a bit away are the, the other disciples, a little bit farther is the rest of the crew. Just if you look at the description of what he's experiencing here, and I think it's often overmissed when we, when we look at the, the, the cross and the crucifixion of Jesus. We miss what's really happening here. I mean, uh, he is so enveloped with this kind of an impenetrable, uh, agonizing, this, this mystery, this contradiction. Uh, uh, Jeremiah wrote prophetically of him. And he said this about the Lord. He said, hey, his heart is turned within him and all his members quake. In Psalms, he's mentioned as this desolate individual who testifies of himself in the Psalms that I am a worm and I am no man. Here's the one, I talk about this mysterious contradiction. Here's the one who declares himself to be the Prince of Peace, but there's no peace here. He's the redeemer of the world, but it seems that someone needs to come and bring redemption for him because of this agonizing suffering that he is experiencing in this moment himself. Just a few paces away are the disciples. The Bible says that he's, as he goes into this deeper part of the garden, he says, he began, therefore, before their eyes, and they give testimony to this, they're watching him becoming very sorrowful and very heavy. I mean, there's a complete emotional change in what's happened. We talked about with the, with the, with the Passover and the Lord's Supper and the coming across and the, the Valley of Kidron where he's talking about in John 14 and 15. You know, and, and dealing with them in, in these, these prophetic ways as he just speaks them. But now his whole demeanor is completely a different word. In fact, if you look at these words in their original language, it gives a, a little bit of a hint that something that's really unheard of, that we're not familiar with, he's experiencing now. It comes over him. I mean, at the same time, in the midst of all this distress it's, that, that's seizing him, he's voluntarily facing it. I mean, he, he is there, and even in the hardest of this moment, even when he's saying, if it's thy will, he's still facing it. Mark has a peculiar manner which he wrote this particular passage. He said, he began to be sore amazed. And if you look at this 
particular definition of this particular word is because they are important. He, he, he makes use of a word here that has to do with uh, something that implies sudden and impending and h- horrific, terrible object that he sees before him, that he's dealing with. It's not just in, uh, something inward. It's something he's dealing with in an outward sense as well as an inward sense. It's not what's just passing on in his mind and his emotions and are deep down in his soul. I mean, something is threatening to rend the nerves. Something is, 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 is like to, to freeze the blood that, that's in his veins, and he's dealing with that. So I think we need to realize that when we talk about the suffering of, of Calvary and the cross or the beatings, so many times people just skip over what Gethsemane was really all about. It is a term, this garden that describes it. Was, it was a place where olives were grown and then you know, olive oil was manufactured from the olives. And they had a, a process of uh, over a heavy stone of grinding these olives down and they would be pressed, which basically meant these, they would be crushed. And literally this is what Jesus is undergoing. We think about the crushing agony of all those beatings the crushing agony of the humiliation and the, the I mean, the, thr- the thorn of crowns, the, you know, the, the spear in his side, the nails in his hand. But I think the biggest brunt is, is in the preparation for that here. Because you, these words describing him here are far different what describes in other places. And so I really do believe he's experiencing this crushing. The first time that olives would be crushed would be, would be the oil that we get for, would, would come out of it that would be used for priestly service. And then another secondary for, for other things. A third time crushed was mostly for menial tasks that oil would be used. We, we would call that first crushing what we would call virgin oil. It's the first crushing that takes place. And this is, this is exactly what's going on. There is a, a crushing that is going before him. I mean, just, just look a little closer at him. The hearts turn with him. His members quake. Now he's there for before their eyes, very sorrowful and very, very heavy. And now he's sore amazed. And it's a terrible moment that he's facing. If you look at them, at, Jesus gets up and he, he experiences this, this three times. You know, again, that's, you talk about biblical numerology the, the, of the Trinity there, but ultimately for the sins of all mankind. He's there. He returns to the, to the disciples in, in this moment. And it casts kind of a, a strong light on what is really his inmost mindset is or the, the state of his being when he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. So it not just talks about really the, the measure of what he's facing, it's big, but the nature. There's, this, there's this, this kind of suffering that's down deep in the heart and deep in the soul. Another sequel to then the gospel says he was in agony. Another translation said, he wrestled with death. So you have to understand and and appreciate what Jesus went through ultimately. But, I mean, think about the height of that distress, the depth of that distress, the agonizing, you know, moment. And then he goes back to his disciples, you you know, his three friends that he's brought in. uh, and, And by some means and measure, he has them there for a reason. One, to I would think, just to... For them to be the witness, but I think also there's he's Jesus is still man as well as God. And there's something about company, fellowship, that is somehow consoling in that time for him, even in their sleep. How many times have have, have people come to me and said, you know, so and so is grieving, or they've lost somewhere, they're in a real time, or their family's falling apart. I just don't know what to say to them. I said sometimes it's not what you say. Sometimes it's just more important to be there just more important to be there anybody can pat you on the back and quote your bible verse amen which most of the time those situations the last thing we want <laughs> but it's something else if you really want to code soul some if you're available you're there and I often especially when we had some deep losses in our life has that just been so true we we don't necessarily want somebody to come up and give us a sermonette we do want somebody just to be there put an arm around us, grab our hand, have a word of prayer for us, care for us. So Jesus is here, and, and he's telling them in this moment, he said, listen, don't run off, all right? Terry, Terry here, and watch with me. I mean, it, he means don't leave me. Your presence is a comfort on some level, all right? Even though it's not they, it's him who needs to be pitied. But he says, Terry, you here. You know, I mean, 
this is a hard place here is in, in his life right now. The vicinity where he's found himself right now, uh, it, it's so horrid that even the sight of the disciples must bring some kind of mercy, grace. He says, watch with me. And he's letting them know, I'm, 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 I'm fighting death here. And requests their presence. And he goes back and he prays the second time. And again, he offers that same prayer about the cup, you know. And it says, he tore himself from them and he proceeded about a stone's throw away into the recesses of the garden. And he's in there and he sinks to his knees again and in on his face and he's supplicating, you know, and crying out. Uh, for, you know, he cries this out several times during the, this whole process. But Abba, Father, everything is possible to you. Anything's possible to you. Take away this cup from me. But nevertheless, not what I will, but that what you will. That verse has caused a lot of confusions for a lot of people over the ages. They think, well, okay, Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew what he came to do. He knew he was there to pay the price for the sins. He knew he was going to the cross. I mean, he set his face, Scripture says, towards Jerusalem. You know, he told everybody else what, around him what was coming. And now he's asking to be delivered from that. Now, I think we misunderstand what's being said here, and I, I want to take that up in just a moment. But let, let's take it kind of in the order that it's happening. All right, Jesus rises up again with anguish from the ground, hastens back to the disciples, and finds them, how inconceivably, sinking back in deep sleep again. <laughs> he awakens Peter, first of all, and says, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldn't you watch just one hour? That's over in Luke 22 where he addresses him personally in around verse 40. and 39, he's dealing with this in 41, and he addresses them again, warning the, the, the group of three of him, you guys need to watch and you need to pray lest you enter into temptation. I mean, there's a war going on here in this garden. And, this, and I think part of that war was these guys kept going to sleep. You ever notice how you can have a perfect night's sleep and still come to church and want to go to sleep? <laughs> Sometimes all the devil has to do is just sing us a lullaby during the sermon and just put us out. And Jesus said, don't you realize what is going on here? You need to pray. You need to, you need to be seeking the Father with me. And then he leaves them again and returns again back in, 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 into the, the, the deeper shades of the garden and prays a second time. And it's kind of somewhat altered in the Gospels. This time he prays, oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, Except I drink it, thy will be done. And then the writer of the gospel says, and then he prayed even more earnestly. So you don't see Jesus running from this. Whatever this is, you don't see, you don't see Christ on the retreat. He's drinking the cup. He's accepting what the Father's will is. You say, well, okay, what, what really is meant by this request to take the cup from me? If, if Jesus is not asking for all this to, you know, just to completely go away, he knows exactly what he's saying. Remember, I think there's a couple reasons. When Jesus Christ comes to the earth, remember, he's still God. He's just clothed it all in flesh. And he's 100% he's man, and he's 100% God. The only time you see Jesus acting as God is when the Father tells him to. Walk on the water, heal the sick, raise the dead, you know, give sight to the blind. And you see these supernatural, omniscient, omnipotent acts of Jesus acting in, his, in his, his sovereign role as the Lord of all creation. But he only does that when the Father tells him to do it. In other words, Jesus lived his life the same way he's asked us to live our life, by faith. Just live by faith. And he modeled what it means to live by faith. We just live according to the will of God, to the word of God, and what God desires. And so here Jesus is, you know, who has the power to pass the cup away if he desires to. If he wants to, he can. But he's God, and he cannot sin at that point. And so he just, he, he, he seeks the Father on this, and he says, hey, if there's any other way to, to let this, you know. I remember Jesus, he's, he still has unlimited power. But again, in, in a moment of faith, he's, he's, he's calling upon the Father. Whatever you permit, Father, I'll drink it. He's not praying to be delivered from the, from the cross, you know, that, that was before him. It's just the horrors that he's dealing with in Gethsemane. Just the agonies. I mean, you know, 
and, and he desires nothing ultimately than what is the counsel of God. And he's praying more earnestly to know the counsel of God. And he just asks if it's possible for this cup to pass from me, then, Lord, let it come. And he only asks the Father, Lord, you, you can do all things. And, I, you know, without infringing upon the work of redemption, if this cup is part of that work can pass from me, then let it pass. Because you go back and you look at these things about the, the depth and the, of, of the, this difficulty that he's facing. He said, Father, well, everything is possible with you, but if this is your will, so be it. My request is I'll drink this cup to the dredge as if that's what you desire, to the finish. So don't doubt the urgency of what Christ is you know, doing here. He's only asking if this cup, not the cross, not redemption, this agony right here, this facing, what I'm facing right now. And I think there's three, three causes that kind of lay at the base of this, this suffering that he's dealing with in the garden that made it more awful than anything else. You know, and what would those be? Well, one, I think, is the agony of having to face the horrors of sin, the amazement at the abomination of what sin is and rebellion really is because the Bible says he who knew no sin he became sin. I mean, now he's seeing everything in a completely different view by taking them upon himself and facing what he's facing in, in the midst of what the cross is going to bring. He, he, he sees and senses apostasy. He's never known what apostasy is. He, he, it's sin. He, he sees, he's seeing and, 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 and experiencing this, uh, what it means to be a rebel against God and how horrendous and how horrible and how utterly depraved that, that sin is and what it results in is so wicked and so unclean and so unrighteous and so abhorred by God that it, the wages of it's death. And so he's standing there before that, everything that's against the will of God, the curse, the death, perdition, hell, all that stands before him. He said, there's, he said there's something approaching him. He sees what's approaching him. And he's, he's praying to his father. Second of all, the abominable nature of that, the, the, the Lord experienced now, what is he experiencing in here? I think he's experiencing the curse of that, that, that he's there. This is what's seizing him. He, he sees himself as the, the culprit before God. All that's implied by that, what does that mean? I'm going to be separated. I've never known separation of intimacy with my father. I'm, I'm getting ready to stand in the gap I will be deprived of the grace and the mercy and the blessing and the intimacy of, of walking with my father. I'm going to be estranged from his love and from his affections. I'm going to be cut off as a child of wrath. He sees and feels that deeply and inwardly and vitally in this situation. He's descending, not ascending. He's descending into the, to the, the feelings and the distress of, of the damned of the judged, and there he goes. Psalms 22 finds all their fulfillment. I encourage you to read the whole chapter, lady, but it says something like, be not far from me, for trouble is near. There's none to help. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. I mean, his soul is conscious of God's grace and preeminence, but he can't taste it, and he can't, he can't sip of that mercy. And it becomes a cup of trembling, that the prophetic words of the prophets would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that he has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows. Well, here it is. I think the, the third cause of that would be the fact of just the, the spiritual battle that's going on. That in Gethsemane is the nearness of the fallen spirits and all the rebellious angels of heaven have come down. It's beyond a doubt that Satan is contributing to this whole scenario in the garden. Jesus told him on the way there in that upper room, he says, hey, the prince of the world cometh. He's not going to find anything in me, but I'm going to present myself as that sacrifice. And these demons are allowed to array themselves in that jeering hostility despair assailing him, coming against him, torturing, insidious 
dissuasions to push him away from human redemption. Suffice it to say, the Lord's faith, as well as the Lord's patience, his fidelity, his perseverance, and the work that he's undertaken to redeem us, he stays the course and he drinks of the cup. Psalms 18 says, The sorrows of death have compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid, and the sorrows of hell compassed me about, as the snares of death prevented me. I hope that somehow, and again, when I started this message, I said words are not going to be able to really portray what he's going through here. And you, this can't be separated from This is all part of the cross. And, and he comes to them, and he, he comes back to them, and he says, hey, the hour is coming. You know? In, in Matthew, it put, he puts it this way. He tells them, he rises up, he comes to the disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Now, the next verse says, while he was saying this to them, they arrived. And we'll pick up with that part of it next week. All right? Now, in this moment, he has resigned himself to everything else that's going to come. Completely to about. An angel has come and refreshed him at this moment, gave him strength for continuing this journey. But can I can't even imagine the isolation and the loneliness which he is enduring here, which he's getting ready to endure when everybody flees. And everything that he's preached and everything that's been said by the prophets is being fulfilled. And the Lamb of God is getting ready to have his blood sprinkled on the altar as he's taken to Calvary. You know, my prayers, we, we've been in this particular series starting last week and all the way till we get to Easter Sunday, has been that somehow in our fellowship, we would experience the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I know in English that term doesn't really come across well. We think, oh, the passion, he loves us. He has passion for us. That word passion in its original context is a word which means love that bears the deepest sorrow, suffering, trials, and tribulation on behalf of the one they love. And when, so when we talk about the passion, we're talking about the suffering, what he endured, the agony, those things that would drive even the very Son of God to say, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, I'll drink all of it if it's thy will to somehow just step back for a moment and realize the depth of love that God has for us. John 17, there's that high priestly prayer, only popped one slide up, but that preceded these prayers of Gethsemane. Whether it happened there in the upper room as he prayed for them or when they first get to Gethsemane, we're not quite sure where that priestly prayer comes in. A lot of people call it, you know, the, the, uh, the Lord's Prayer because it really is the Lord's Prayer. They go back to the Lord's Prayer, which most people call that, that's just the model prayer. When they said Jesus teaches how to pray, and he says pray like this, and he explains to them the elements of prayer, the glory of God, thankfulness, intercession, you know, supplication, thanksgiving, all that's part of that. But this prayer that he's praying is an intercessory prayer that he not only prayed for the present disciples, but he makes it clear in his prayer to the Father, he sees all of us that have come to him, and he's praying for all of us. And the Bible says he ever lives, I mean, he's alive right now, to make intercession for us that he is our advocate interceding for us. If, if somewhere in your heart and mind you have bought the bill of goods that Satan sells, that somehow God has forgotten you or God doesn't love you or God doesn't understand, then you have forgotten what the scriptures teach, that he is ever interceding and he ever loves you with an everlasting love that is willing to go to the deepest agonies of hell for you. That's how much God loves you. And it's more could be written that we have forgotten him. I, I cannot help but think when we read these passages and think of all that Jesus has done for us, at least in my own life, how little I've done for him. We're living in a comfortable society in America, at least for now. <laughs> Everything's easy. You know, you, you, you may think it's not, but it is. Yesterday, I, I spent some time communicating back and forth with uh, 
one of the lead pastors I worked with in Cuba, and he was just saying, you know, what God was doing, how in this last year, he said, he said, even this last year, he said, we were able to plant 18 churches. He said, even with that pandemic and everything, we were able to, he said, and each one of those new works baptized, led to Jesus and baptized at least 20 new people each in each one of those. That's about 360, 400 people come to the Lord. He said in this little short, he said, even facing all the difficulties we have. He said, do you not, he said, I don't know if you realize it, he said, but Cuba, if you read the news, it ranks as the most destitute country in the world now. It's not getting help, especially right now from Russia. <laughs> they can't hardly help themselves spending all the money they're spending, all the sanctions that have occurred. Even when we were there in 2019, all the difficulties they were facing, fuel shortages, food shortages. We went to a restaurant. We would go out to eat with our team. It would, you know, it would be unique to find anything on the menu you wanted. They'd come out and they'd tell you the one or two things they would have. When you kind of talk amongst ourselves, well, well, you won't take, you'll take, I'll take that part, you take that part. One restaurant, we said, we got one piece of pork and we got three pieces of chicken. What do you want? <laughs> you have anything on the side? We have some potatoes. <laughs> How would you like them? No fuel. Had to send out guys at night to find fuel for the trucks so we could travel across the island, different places. And I'm thinking, God is doing such a supernatural work there right now. And that's just his little province he wasn't talking about. He said, this is happening all over the island. You know, it's, this is happening everywhere, this, this destitution of people are coming to the Lord. I got to think in my mind, look how blessed we are. If we have one person saved in the next 20 months, we'll be happy. Why is it that way? I think we can only get on and say, well, it's because of you. It's because of me. Are we doing what God's called us to do? Do we go out the highways and byways and compel people to come in? You know, are we content to, to do something for the glory of God? Are we just still sitting on our hands? You know, what, what, what is it? Could we not fill this place next Sunday if we all wanted to? Absolutely. Right? If we wanted to, we could. If we were truly passionate about it, we could. I shared with you one time, I'm sure, when I was preaching on the conferences to our Bougain pastors who had been under this communist depression like the Cubans are today. And I said, you know, it's, I said, it's humbling to stand before all of you today and, and minister the word of God to you because I look at you and I see the price that you have paid to live for Jesus. You know, when it was against the law, when God was not welcome and Christians are hated, I said, you've been so faithful. I said, now look at the church in America and I become quite embarrassed. One of the guys came up to me after that and said, you know, put his arms around me and said, Pastor, don't, don't, don't feel too bad about it. He said, I do not know that if I would have lived for Jesus as strongly as I've lived for Jesus, have I been living in America. Everything that you're exposed to, all the draw to comfort, all the draw to ease, all the draw to pleasure, all the draw to being entertained, all the draw to just, you know, sitting back and watching others do whatever it is, whether it's sports or entertainment or whatever it is, that we hadn't had to deal with that. Well, I appreciated that. But I still think that's really no excuse, is it? For us not to be what God's called, for us to not love God the way the scriptures call us to. I, I'm, I'm not trying to beat you up, friends, all right? I'm hoping that somehow something will click on the inside of your heart. It's in view of the awful agonies of Gethsemane we see there's a call in our lives to live for Christ, to share the gospel, to shine like lights, to be the salt of the earth, to make a difference. And if we do not make the difference, then we fail completely. A couple Sundays we'll be doing Easter. That's pretty much everybody's day to go, right? I would ask you to do this right now, today, starting here in this room. That you would ask the Lord over these next few weeks how you can truly serve him and make an impact in the kingdom of God in the days ahead of you. And that you just wake up tomorrow and say, hey, I'm about kingdom business today. That God's putting in front of me ministry today. And I can look at it or not look at it. 
If I have eyes to see, the helper will help me, as he said here. He'll instruct me and he'll show me. But if I ignore the helper, ignore the Holy Spirit, then I just miss it and go about my daily stuff. But Lord, let me know that my daily stuff is really you. And I'm part of what you're doing in the world today. And that you would begin to take upon yourself a list of names of people that you can make an impact in. Yes, the people you see each day, you can invite them to church. You can invite them to Jesus. You can talk to them about the Lord. Hey, do you know the Lord? Do you go to church? And, well, where do you go to that? Well, who's your pastor? That's my second question because they never know. <laughs> Shows they don't go to church a lot. Hey, have you ever given your life to Christ? That's a simple question. You ever given, you ever given your heart to Christ? Do you know what it means to know Jesus? And I gave my life to the Lord back in 1973, made an impact. Witnessing is a, a simple thing. It's just sharing what God's done in your life. But can we take that upon our hearts and our minds again to come back to a renewed place to realize just how much God loves me, I need to love him more. And I need to, it's time for me to bring everything to the table with the Lord. My time, my talents, my treasures, put it all on the table for the Lord. What would you have for me, Lord? What is the cup I'm supposed to be drinking from today? Where am I supposed to be going? Lead me today. If we can do that, God will do a phenomenal and supernatural work in each of our lives if we do that. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to let Jesus get a hold of your life and your heart the next days and weeks and begin to realize that you are, you are the, the tip of the spear, so to say, out there to make the difference? You're the point of connection for a lost world and be that point of connection? If you can do that, you'll be surprised what God will do for you in doing that. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Just a moment, as we pray and put our hearts before the Lord, I invite you to this altar to maybe do business with the Lord, whatever He's spoken to your heart today. Just, just, let's just put everything out there before the Lord. Let Him do in us what He desires to do. Now, I've asked Gary to go get some invite cards for our Easter. They're broken into groups of three. We're just going to come put them on the front here. And as the invitation is going on and they get in here and they start putting out the cards, if you would come and get a group of those three or two groups, those whatever, and take them with you and begin to pray over this. Lord, there are three people out here this week. <laughs> There's got to be at least three people out here that you want me to speak to. There will probably be about 300, but we don't always listen so well. And take those, pray over them, and ask the Lord who it is, and use those things as just a tool. Say, hey, I want to invite you to my church. With this, start with this thing. By the time you might get in here by Easter if you start this week. <laughs> All right? And invite them, pray over them, find out who they are, find out what their name is, and make a serious commitment to the Lord to put those people before the Lord. So they just lay those, we want to lay those out across the altar steps here. And we're just going to worship the Lord. Now, if you're here without the Lord, I'm going to be standing here. You're missing the greatest treasure of life, and that's Jesus himself, who came and gave himself as a sacrifice so you wouldn't have to face all he dealt with in the garden, all that separation from God, the agony, the shame, the guilt, the judgment. He took all that on himself. Amen? So he's done that for you. He's waiting for you to make a decision. I don't know what you're waiting for God to do. He's done it all. It's time to come and give your heart and life to Christ. So let's, let's get surrendered. So I'll be standing here. Pastor Gary will be standing here. Now, if you want to come and just find a place to pray, maybe the Lord's already put some people on your heart, come. I would hope by the time this invitation is over in a minute that everybody's at least come and got some cards and begin to pray over those. Amen. So whether you pray over them here or pray in your seat, you come while we're praying. If you don't know Christ, you come. You want somebody to pray for you, you come. You have a need in your life, we'll be glad to pray for you. If there's some other issue that you're facing, maybe you're looking for a church home, you believe that's where the Lord's leading you, come, be a part of what God is doing and what God is about to do in our midst, amen? Because I believe some great things are coming for the, for the church if we'll participate. Amen? You come, we worship the Lord. Was 
grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains of His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior. His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy Amazing grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved, how precious did Sing it. Sing it out loud. Big. I've been set free. Sing it, church. My God, my Savior. Yes, you have. Has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing. Father, we bless you today, and we thank you for your mercy and your grace. It is amazing, Father. Help us to see, to know, to understand deeply what that grace cost, that we might be brought into your family. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. You may be seated. My name is Joe Arms, and I approve that message. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. Be praying, be praying, be praying for me.
you know, and I'd ask you to do one other thing uh, with our men's group uh, at, at the Magnolia campus. I know we have a men's group that meet here and prays. Let's continue praying. If you ever want to join one of those early morning prayer groups, you can. Say, well, I'm not a man. Well, then start a ladies' prayer group, amen, and they'll meet. And uh, so, but if we pray, uh, God does supernatural things in our midst. So let's continue to pray and believe God. Do put on your prayer list Cuba. One thing that his pastor was asking today is, and he said, just pray for my village. He said, God's doing a lot of things. He said, but just seems right here, and I know how this feels sometimes in, in, in our own lives. We feel like it's not really happening here like it's happening over there or in some other place. He said only 5%. He said it was 0.5%, half a percent of the people in this village profess to know Christ. And uh, he said, pray for Marti, M-A-R-T-I, Cuba. So be lifting up Marti. And all these other things that God is doing. But let's also be lifting up what God has us about in our place of worship and fellowship. Amen. Brother Gary's got a few closing announcements and we will be dismissed. Amen. So uh, today, immediately after service, we are having our Easter clothing distribution day. And it's going to be in our fellowship hall. So immediately following the service, uh, you could go into the fellowship hall. And Miss Pam is opening the door right now um, so that you can partake in some of the, the items that they have for our children for Easter Sunday. And so feel free to go in there. Now, if you invited somebody that, unable to attend, that were unable to attend today, this is not the only time. And so uh, let them know to get in contact with the church. And Miss Pam will set up a, a special time for them to come. It'll probably be upstairs where they can come in and shop upstairs uh, for that Easter item um, the, and, and clothes in general. Don't forget tonight is our evening activities, Awana's Lift and Youth. Now, uh, Wednesday night service. Last week we talked about being a friend and what it means to be a friend. Uh, this Sunday we're going to talk about how, or this Wednesday, uh, how... For us, salvation was free. It cost Jesus his life, amen? But for us, it's a free gift. What cost us our life is discipleship. It cost us because we have to desire to be disciples. We have to deny ourselves. We have to take up our cross daily. And we have to desire to follow Christ no matter what. For some of us, it's I'll follow Christ to a point. But what it cost us is we have to be willing to serve and follow Christ no matter what. So join us this Wednesday as we continue the harmony of the Gospels. We're going to be in Matthew 9 and the individual calling of Matthew by Jesus. Um, ladies retreat is May 5th through 7th. You can sign up today. Uh, the cost is $140. There is a deposit of $110 due. Uh, that early bird price does go, uh, does go away April, April 10th, so be sure to sign up. Also, kids camp registration starts today. You can do it in person or you can go online to our website to sign up for that. For more information, please visit our website. Don't forget to stay connected uh, with our uh, Facebook YouTube, our website. Um, also want to say one thing about discipleship in regards to our ministries. Of course, today we're having our, our clothing distribution, and that is one way we can disciple to people. But another ministry that sometimes goes, often goes unnoticed um, is our food pantry. And for the past month, we've, we've had people walk in, and, and we've been able to provide them with items, food items, and, and toiletries, things like that. But between November and to date, the, the food pantry has been able to minister and to disciple over 120 individuals and families. And that is because of the church. And because of your calling to be disciples. And many of y'all go shopping for the food pantry. Many of y'all serve in the food pantry. But it is be doing, it's putting feet to our faith. And so continue to just pray for our ministries, but also pray about how God will use you in those ministries. Maybe there's a ministry we don't even have yet that God is putting on your heart to be a part of and to serve. And so that's what being a disciple is. Amen. Finally, don't forget your tithes and offerings. Three ways to give online, in person, or you could drop a check off in the office Monday through Thursday. We have offer receptacles in the back. We don't pass a plate. If you're giving online, there's a new uh, option on there. So 
when you go to our, our PayPal, there is now an option to pay for or to donate to the fee. PayPal charges us a fee. It's like 2.2, 2.5, something like that. It's thousands of dollars when you add that up at the end of the year that the church pays in fees. And so there is an option to add that to your giving, online giving. And so you don't have to calculate that 2.5%. It just automatically does that. So you can click on that on PayPal and it'll add to whatever you're giving. Amen. If you need more information, you can call Joseph. I know I butchered it, but you can call Joseph on Monday. He can give you more insight on that. Amen. Amen. Main thing is don't forget your tithes and offerings. Um, with that being said, I think I got everything. You can please enter through the fellowship. Also, don't forget our fellowship on the tent. Sign up. Miss Angela's been doing a great job with that, so sign up for our fellowship on the tent. With that being said, you are dismissed.